It's really good to have you with us and to be able to meet together again. And hopefully we will be able to now meet together regularly every week. So we'll just praise God uh, for this opportunity. So first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Amelia and the family for uh, beginning to record some things for us uh, before the service, which we can use. And we look forward to that time when we can actually have live music together in the church. Secondly, um, some apologies for David. Uh, he just started this series and um, then realised that he, well, he knew he'd double booked, but he thought that both churches would still be doing Zoom, so he thought that he'd be able to do both services. But um, unfortunately, or fortunately, he can now meet uh, in the church, and so um, he's gone to, uh, where he's staying in Coventry, uh, at Marley's church, attending the service there this morning. He has recorded his talk, so you will be able to hear that and see that. Uh, but I shall be taking the rest of the service. So we're going to start this morning uh, by a short reading from Ephesians, Ephesians 1, uh, 3 to 4, and 7 to 8. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So we're going to pray together as we start this service. And I feel that it's appropriate this morning to pray, uh, particularly for the Royal Family at this time. So let's come together in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you chose us before the creation of the world and have forgiven our sins through the redeeming blood of Christ. You call us to follow and serve you. And this morning we want to give thanks for the life of the Spirit and the service which he has given to this nation and to our people. And in particular, we want to pray for her now as she faces a future without her husband. Lord, watch over her and protect her as she continues to serve you in the role which you have given her as Queen and also within the family which surround her name. And so Lord, we just commit these prayers to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We're going to start with our first song, which is, I lift your name on high. And one of the great difficulties about being in church and being together is we can't sing. And I know that's one of the things which so many people find so difficult. I would suggest to you, if you'd like to do this, that this, this song, you can actually use your hands and your body to worship God. It's not quite the same as singing, but you can lift your hands and take part in the song in that way. you're in my life I'm 
so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth to show Say 
Because there we have this picture of Jesus already at the height of popularity. His teaching has so impressed people that the whole house is full, full beyond the doors and a crowd beyond that. It's almost like a preview of Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowd is there supporting him and affirming him attentive to his every word. But it's a beautiful story because it's the story of committed friendship. Here are four men willing to carry their friend who can no longer walk. We don't know how far they carried him, but they're willing to carry him up on the roof and sort everything out. Here are four people whose friendship really counts towards this fifth person. They haven't dismissed him because he's been paralysed. They haven't rejected him because they pointed the finger and said, you must have sinned for this to happen. No, they remain good and constant and loyal friends. And friendship is a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful story because of their ingenuity. They're not put off by the fact that a crowd surrounds the house, there's no way into the house, they know Jesus is there and they will do anything to get their friend in front of Jesus. So they climb the roof, climb upon the roof, break it up and let their friend down. It's a beautiful story. And of course, it has a beautiful outcome. But within the beauty, there is a strong band of bitterness. Because what Jesus says and does offends some of the people from Jerusalem, some of the religious lawyers that were also there to keep their eye on Jesus. They are distressed, perplexed, and accuse Jesus of the worst crime that there was, 
blasphemy of taking God's name in vain, of directly uh, insulting God. And as one commentator has put it, in this story, in miniature, we have the whole story of the Gospel of Mark. The power of Jesus' teaching, his compassion that leads him to heal, his confrontation with the religious leaders, the accusation of blasphemy which would be repeated by Caiaphas, and then his crucifixion, his death. But his death leads to other people's life. It is, I find, I hope you do too, a beautiful, beautiful story right at the beginning of the Gospel. And forgiveness is at the heart of our Christian faith. If you turn with me to the end of Luke's Gospel, just for a moment, to Luke chapter 24, we have the risen Jesus addressing the disciples and when he's opened their minds, he commissions them. He gives them their future work to do. And he said, it's written the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. There it is, you see. You are to go and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in my name to all nations. And what happens on the day of Pentecost when they've received that promise, that power from God? Well, Peter gets up and preaches, doesn't he? He tells the story of what has happened to Jesus and of the significance of that. And eventually people are cut in their hearts and they say, what must we do? And what does Peter say? He says, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It takes us to the very heart of the Gospel, this beautiful story of the man being healed by Jesus. But I want us to, to look a little more deeply into this, because Jesus says your sins are forgiven. But what do we mean by forgiveness? We use the word a lot, but what, what do we really mean? It's quite a complex issue once you start to think about it. Basically, to forgive someone was to cancel their debt. And some versions of the Lord's Prayer, instead of saying, forgive us our sins or forgive us our trespasses, say, forgive us our debts. Because that's the root idea. You owe me something, I'll release you from the debt. You can't pay it, I'm not going to put you in prison, I'm going to release you from the debt. Forgive them. And it moves on from there to think, think about also releasing people from their obligations, cutting them free from their, those. So forgiveness means whatever we owe, we're released from and it no longer is our burden to carry. But then it, it moves on a little bit further and it begins to mean, please don't hold anything against me. I may have done you wrong, but, but don't hold it against me anymore. Let me off. Set me free. Let me go. And then it moves another step into meaning, don't let what I've done, about which I'm truly sorry, Please don't let what I've done spoil or damage our relationship. I want us to get on just as we did in the past. Please forgive me so we can continue with our friendship or our relationship. And then there's another shift that happens, and that is that sometimes, quite often in fact, the focus moves from the person who's done the wrong asking for forgiveness to the person saying, I will forgive you. And so we had the father of a man whose daughter was killed in that dreadful Lockerbie accident saying he forgives those who planted the bomb and caused her death. Or we might have the situation where there's, there's been a gang murder and the mother or the father of the young man usually that's been murdered says, 
I don't want this to go on breeding and causing more and more pain and bitterness and death. I forgive those who did it. And this is one of the strong marks of a Christian faith, of course. It's one of the things that Jesus encourages, indeed commands us to do. And we pray it all the time, don't we? Forgive my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Completely releasing people from the debt. And the value for the person who does that is that they're saved from becoming twisted, their minds being distorted, their whole personality dragged down by clinging to the bitterness they feel towards those who've damaged a loved one. So forgiveness is quite a complex idea when we start to think about it. Forgive me for my sins. Cancel my debts. Release me from my obligations. Forget I ever did it allow us to go on in a relationship of trust and friendship that matters to us all. So, a little bit of thought about what it means to forgive. But when Jesus sees this man being lowered before him, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And that's a rather controversial matter as well. Where's the controversy? Well, the first controversy is this. Is Jesus saying that this man is paralysed because he sinned? He may very well be doing that. But that does not mean, let me state it very clearly, that does not mean that every time someone is sick, we can say, ha ah, I wonder what sin they committed. Someone pointed out, if that were the case, all of us would be lying on our backs wrapped in pain because we're all sinful and therefore if sin equated and led to sickness every time we'd all be sick all the time because all have sinned and come short of God's glory. And Jesus himself made it clear that he cut the connection which was prevalent in their society that sin implied sickness and sickness implied sin. There was a blind man, if you remember, and the disciple said to Jesus, Who sinned? Is it this man or is it his parents? Surely somebody's caused this sickness. And Jesus said, No, it's not like that. Jesus normally cuts the connection between sin and sickness. Sin does not always cause sickness because you're sick. You don't have to go hunting in your past to find out what dreadful thing you did that has caused this. But in this instance, Jesus saw that the root cause of this man's sickness was some kind of sin, the guilt he was carrying for something he did. We don't know what it was. So there's one of the controversies. The second controversy is, why does it involve God? You see, when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven, he was using what scholars call a divine passive. In Jesus' culture, among the Jews, they didn't ever use God's name or even the word God if they could possibly avoid it. And one way they avoided it was when God was being thought of as doing something, they would put it in a passive voice. So when Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven, he's really saying in our language, God is forgiving you your sins. Which is, of course, why those scribes and lawyers got so uptight. But why does God get involved? I mean, suppose when I drive home, I run into my neighbour's fence and knock it over. I could go to him and say, I'm really sorry, I hope you'll forgive me. And he could say yes. And then from across the road comes the neighbour who lives there and he says, what have you done to my fence? And I might say, why, why not keep your nose out of our business? I'm talking to my neighbour about it. But if it turned out that he owned that house and the neighbour rented it and the one across the road would therefore have to pay the bill, you could understand why he might want to get involved in our discussion. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, 
in the psalm that is linked to that, Psalm 51, he says, Against you, you only have I sinned, O Lord. Now, I don't think he meant that he hadn't sinned against his own wife by committing adultery. He had also sinned by seducing Bathsheba, putting her in a position where she couldn't refuse. And then he'd gone on to arrange the murder of her husband so that he wouldn't be incriminated, that is, David wouldn't be incriminated in what had happened. He had committed terrible things against several people. But he says, against you, you only have I sinned. Because at that point, as he stood before God, he knew he had broken God's commands. He had committed adultery. He had committed murder. He had actually borne false witness against Uriah as well. He had broken God's commandments. And so he was very conscious that it was God he had sinned against, even though it was through damage to human beings that that had taken place. And so it is, whenever we sin, we have affronted God. We've broken his commandments. We've said, God, we disregard what you have told us is the only way to behave that is pleasing to you. We have failed God. So that too is a controversial issue. Why bring God into it if I've sinned against my neighbour? I've tried to explain that, but we can go a little bit further if you like. So if I uh, unfortunately hit my neighbour's cat, or dog. Yes, the cat and the dog would suffer, but I would go to my neighbour and say, I'm really sorry what's happened. Will you forgive me? And you see, everything in the world, every human being, belongs to God. So if we damage another human being by sinning against them, however trivial that might be, we've actually damaged someone that God loves and holds accountable. So we've damaged God as well. So every sin involves God and we need his forgiveness. But there's an, another point of uh, controversy in all of this as well, because some people say forgiveness sounds fine, but actually don't you destroy the moral order if you go around forgiving people? Do people no longer have to give account of themselves? How do we ensure that they don't go on repeating it? And that's a very interesting point, isn't it? And there were people who said in Paul's time, let's sin so that grace may abound. Surely it's a good thing to go on sinning because we shall see more of God's grace. The moral order was being dissolved. But of course, the very reason that that is not valid in the end is because of something else, and that is that forgiveness costs. Forgiveness always costs. If I let you off a debt you owe me, I'm out of pocket. It costs me something. But in a way, much of the Old Testament is creating an awareness, an atmosphere of people understanding that if they sin, putting it right is a costly business. So if you read, for instance, in Leviticus chapter 16 about the Day of Atonement and all the details of rituals that have to be gone through in order for Israel to be cleansed from the sins of that year, you begin to get an understanding that sin was costly. It costs the priest and the high priest a great deal of time and effort that they could be clean enough to deal with the, the sacrifices. And then, of course, it cost the lives of animals so that they could be set free from their sin. A cost is involved, and that was built into their awareness through centuries of understanding that if they sinned, they sinned against God and they needed God's forgiveness. A cost is involved. And then along comes Isaiah, and especially Isaiah 53. And it talks there about the suffering servant. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. What's going on? Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, that is because of what he'd done wrong. But no, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Our healing, our forgiveness cost this servant and cost his life. And from there, of course, we move to the New Testament, where we see the cost in terms of the life and especially the death of Jesus. That's why it's constantly talking about the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sin. He had to give his life. There was a price to be paid. God didn't just say, oh, it doesn't matter. I don't care about your sins. No. God cared deeply because it damaged the people he'd created, the creation that he'd made, and in the end it cost the life of his son, his very own life, in order for us to be set free. And if we are going to claim forgiveness, receive forgiveness, then we cannot take it lightly because we stand in front of a cross that constantly reminds us of what it cost God to forgive us. So it costs God, but in a way it costs those who seek forgiveness too. The Bible tells us that wherever possible we should make restitution when we realise we've done wrong. That's what Zacchaeus did when Jesus went to his house and Jesus says salvation's come to this house because this man has realised the wrong he's done and he's going to pay back what he's stolen, what he's defrauded people. He was making restitution and if we can, we should do that. But we need to confess our sins, to own up to it, to acknowledge that it was wrong. And it has damaged other people and has damaged God. That's what confession involves. And it costs us because we need to turn from our sins. That's why so often you'll find repentance linked with forgiveness. And it's not that easy sometimes to give up your sinful ways, your sinful attitudes, your sinful thoughts, your sinful behaviour. Because we can become addicted to them. But we want to say to God when we're receiving his forgiveness, change me, set me free, not just forgive me, but cleanse me, release me, wipe my hard drive clean so that I'm not taunted by the past. And if we recognise that and we are struggling, then it's okay to seek help, to ask people to pray with us, to talk us through and to hold us accountable. Because... Forgiveness costs not only God who offers it, but us who receive it. And as I've said, it costs Jesus his life. It seemed simple enough to be able to say to the paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or if you don't like that, you're healed. Get up, carry your mat, go off. And of course, the man did. And the man was transformed because he had truly received God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ. It costs Jesus, but he gladly offers it because he wants to see us free from our sin and shaped in a perfectly godlike way. And that's what he's always at work to do. Which brings us to the final point, very briefly, there are benefits to being forgiven. We can see that with this man. He was set free, he could go back, he could live a normal life, he could become part of his family, he could start earning again and supporting them. His whole life was transformed by receiving the forgiveness and the healing that went with it. And whenever we receive Christ's forgiveness, paid for by the cross, 
then we have the opportunity to be transformed. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, to do that work within us, but we need to be willing for it to happen. So this is a beautiful story. It's sad, isn't it, that the heart of it was the bitter reaction of those religious leaders because they were afraid of what Jesus was doing and who it, it made him out to be. But what it made him out to be was true because he was giving God's forgiveness and doing it in his name. That's why when Jesus left those disciples, as we began this morning, this, this morning he said, repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations in my name. Jesus has the authority. He had it then and he has it now. And he wants to bring his total forgiveness with its transforming power into our lives. That's part of the good news of Jesus. Thank you. We're going to move now into a time of prayer. And I think, I always think that we're fortunate in this church that whenever we look at the front, the thing that we always see is the big cross. And as David's been talking about the power of the cross of salvation, we've had that before us all the time. And one good thing about this portrayal of the cross is that Christ is not on the cross, Christ is risen. And that is our assurance that he hears our sins, that our sins are forgiven when we listen to him and we ask for forgiveness. And then there is light in the cross because we then can share God's love with the rest of the world. So as we come to pray now, um, I'm going to start with just going through a prayer that is so familiar to us, which is the Lord's Prayer. And then we're just going to go into a time where we meditate on that a little bit and we think through uh, what that actually means for us. So either keep your eyes focused on that cross or bow your heads, whichever is most appropriate for you. And then if you remember the words, then just join them with them quietly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lord, we've said those words so many times. They trip off our tongue lightly. So easy to say, but so difficult to live. How amazing that the creation of the universe, in all its complexity and the origin of life itself, should stoop to listen to our individual prayer requests this morning. How amazing that even before the creation of the world, God planned our salvation through Jesus and his sacrifice for us. So this morning, Lord, we just thank you for wiping out our sins when we chose to follow you. That we are forgiven through your grace. But Lord, we are aware that we fail you still as we try to follow you. And so Lord, we come to a time of confession. As individuals, we confess before you now. The times when we forget to pray, when we vainly struggle in our own strength. The times when we are economical with the truth to ourselves as well as the world around us. The times when we hurt those around us intentionally or without thinking.
when we forget to do the things we promise faithfully that we will do. The times where we boast of our achievements and forget to give you the glory. Lord, this morning we open our hearts to you. We bow before you and we ask your forgiveness for those things in us which we are not being. But Lord, we thank you that you hear us and that this morning you forgive us. We pray for our nation too. Lord, we confess that as a nation there are many times when we are racist. There are times when we do not care for the poor and the socially vulnerable. When those in power, whatever that is, use their positions to gain wealth and prestige instead of serving the community. And Lord, as we raise those prayers and we pray earnestly about those things, we ask also that you forgive us when we do nothing to stop it, because it's not easy to stand up for you in these situations. But Lord, we know that you hear us and you answer our prayers because you are a loving and forgiving God. We remember too from this prayer that we so often pray that it says, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against and every, those who sin against us. And every time we hurt someone else, Lord, we know that we are hurting you because they are your creation, just as we are. And yet you continue to love us. So Lord, please help us to forgive when others hurt us. Help us to think before we respond and say words or take actions which we later regret. Help us, Lord, to become more Christ-like as we try to serve you in all we do. And Lord, we just praise you and worship you this morning. And we know that you answer our prayers through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we come to our final song, and this one echoes the things that we've been thinking and praying, and it's give thanks with a grateful heart.
thank you that you are a forgiving God. We thank you for your love. We thank you that as we follow you, you lead us. And that this morning we can go out into the world knowing that you love us and that you love the community in which we live and work and we're called to serve. So thank you, Jesus. And I have some good news this morning. I think my reading of uh, the government regulations say that we can actually talk to each other when we get outside. <laughs> so what I'm going to say to you is, um, as you go out, please lead out from the back as usual. Please socially distance going out. Please keep your masks on. But when you go outside, please spread out. If you want to talk to somebody, and some people may not feel safe doing that, so please don't chase people. But as you go out, can you keep in socially distant groups if you want to talk to people no more than six, and you still have to be socially distanced, and you have to be socially distanced of the two meters. Can I remind you of this? That is the distance. Wow. That is the distance um, that you're supposed to be separated from the other groups, okay? So, if you do it well this morning, and you're really not okay, you can do it again. If you're naughty, you can say that. Okay, but, but certainly, so thank you. And uh, just can you start leading up?